Hey, I'm Matt. Thanks for watching Grace Online. Today, we're talking about the emotion of being happy. And that's the goal, right? To live a happy life. I mean, that's what I want to experience all the time. Nobody wakes up hoping to have a crappy day. No, most of us live our lives to avoid and get rid of the sadness, the anger, the fear, and just find a happiness. After all, that's what God wants for us too, right? Or is it? See, we spend a lot of time, money, and energy pursuing things that we think will make us happy. But all too soon, it seems like that feeling has left and we just need something else. Now, don't get me wrong, God did create us to experience happiness, but maybe that's not the end goal. Maybe there's something more that he wants us to experience. What was the first job you ever had growing up? And listen, I'm not talking about like babysitting or, or going out and mowing the lawn. I'm talking about a job that you actually had to get like a W-2 for. So I, I remember the first job I ever had was working at Olympia Sports. Uh, I think I was like 15 years old and it was my first real job that I, I had like a boss and different shifts and time cards and you know, all that jazz. I was also at the time getting ready to drive and because of that, my parents had actually just bought me my first car, which was a, a 1989 Jeep Wrangler. And to this day, uh, one of the best cars I've ever owned, even though, you know, half of its life it was spent in the shop, but I still loved it. Now, before you think, wow, must be, you know, must be nice. Parents bought him a car, you know, must, must be nice. Let me clarify. It was uh, $2,500 and I had to pay back every single cent to my parents. So I, I got the job at Olympia Sports to, to kind of start that process of paying them back. And I will never forget my first paycheck. I had worked almost every night um, closing up, you know, from like six to six to close, five to close. And I calculated it out that that week I, I would make about 150 bucks. Now, that was more money than I had ever made in a week uh, up until this point. And so I was just, I was so happy. Like I had everything planned out that I would do with that 150 bucks. I would go and eat a bunch of food. I'd buy some new cleats for soccer. I'd buy a new basketball. I'd eat more food. I'd get some ice cream and I'd eat more food, right? There's a theme here. I was just spending a lot of it on food. But I remember when I got my paycheck and I looked at it for the first time, I noticed that with taxes taken out, uh, went from about $150 to about $90. And then when I went home, I had to give my parents $75 to start paying for my Jeep. And before I knew it, my paycheck went from about 150 bucks to about 15. And that happiness that I had once felt when I was like, oh, 150 bucks, that happiness was gone. And maybe you've had moments like this. Maybe you're a student and, and this summer you went away to a summer camp and you, you like had an incredible time. You had like a camp high. Or maybe you've gotten a large bonus from work or, or you've purchased a new boat or you went on a, a family vacation or a, a vacation with friends or maybe you went and saw the new Barbie movie, right? But these moments that have brought you so much happiness, but quickly you've realized that happiness was gone and you were left feeling empty again. And so what did you do? You went on to try to find the next thing that would make you happy. Now, happiness is an emotion that we all want to feel. We even say that we are on the pursuit of happiness, right? Will Smith made a whole movie about this. Uh, Kid Cudi sings a song about the pursuit of happiness. We're pursuing happiness and how it makes us feel at all times, through the movies that we watch, the, the shows that we consume, maybe the relationships we engage in. We, we just wanna find someone that makes us happy. Or maybe we, we do it through the sex that we have. We hope that the sex that we have will, will bring us the happiness that we so desperately are craving. Or maybe we're like, maybe if I just make enough money, right? Uh, uh, then I'll be left feeling fully satisfied and, and truly happy. And we try all of these things and, and what we find is that while it may give us like a temporary satisfaction, it doesn't lead to long-term fulfillment because those things are here today, they're gone tomorrow. And yet in, in Western culture, we're told constantly that we should pursue being happy at all costs. In fact, the, the pastor 
uh, Eugene Peterson uh, once said this, the enormous entertainment industry in our land is a sign of the depletion of joy in our culture. And, And with this observation, he actually makes a key distinction. He makes a distinction between happiness and joy. Happiness is, that's what the entertainment industry provides. A a temporary escape to another place, right? Barbie world to find happiness and forget about our problems. But it's just temporary. It's it's a band-aid on a stab wound. So then what is joy? What is the difference between that and happiness? Well, with that, I want you to open up your Bibles and go to Psalm chapter 16. Open up to the book of Psalms and go to chapter 16. And here's, this was written by King David. And and most scholars um, argue that, that he wrote this during a time in his life where he was in great distress. And so with that, I want to jump into verse seven. And we're going to read verses seven through nine. And this is what it says. David writes, I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with with me. I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. Now listen, listen to verse nine. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety. Now, David in this psalm gives us a beautiful picture of what joy is. And he describes it as joy is a state of being. Happiness is a fleeting emotion. Like that's the distinction that that David is making here. Now, happiness is an emotion that that we all have to navigate. We all experience. And I want to be perfectly clear. It's not a it's not a bad emotion. Like I've heard teachings on on joy and happiness before and it's like, man, one is good, one is bad. I just, I struggle with that. I don't know if that's true. I I think happiness is an emotion that God has given all of us and I would be hesitant to say that it's a bad thing. But when happiness is where we try to find our purpose, our, our meaning and fulfillment, that's when it gets dangerous. Because as quickly as you were happy, you're left looking for the next thing to make you happy. This is where even addiction can begin. This is this is where we can try to numb hurt or pain through happiness. This is when we start having meaningless sex night after night with different people, just hoping that it makes us happy. Eugene Peterson, again, he says this, society is a bored, gluttonous king employing a court jester to divert it after an indulgent meal. But that kind of joy never penetrates our lives, never changes our basic constitution. The effects are extremely temporary. A few minutes, a few hours, a few days at most. And it's I think we see this in our culture. I mean, I was just listening to one of my favorite uh, sports podcasts is the Bill Simmons podcast. And uh, he's a, you know, local dude from Boston who almost became a billionaire just through his podcasting network and and his sports writing. And he was actually talking to Stephen Stephen A. Smith, who's another very successful sports announcer who makes about $13 million a year just working for ESPN. And they both were on this podcast and they were talking about how even after all their awards, all the money, they own multiple homes. After all of that, this is what Bill Simmons said. He said, he's still trying to find the thing that will leave him feeling fully satisfied and whole. And sadly, they went on to say that's why they're chasing that next million dollars, that next award, hoping that. Maybe that's what's going to bring closure and fulfillment in their lives. And this is what happiness does. It's, it's an emotion that we all feel, but it does not lead to true satisfaction. Meanwhile, meanwhile, joy, David writes, he finds in verse 9, this is what he says. He says, no wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests 
in safety. David in this passage tells us that we can experience joy as a, a perpetual state of being. Now, rem- remember, David most likely is writing this from a place of desperation and pain in his life. And yet he says, no wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. But, but how does he end up here? Well, the key is found in the verses just before this statement and just after this statement. So verses seven and eight, again, I want to read these. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. And then he goes on to say, he says, no wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. Why? Because my body rests in safety. He says, the Lord guides me. I know he's always with me, with me. And because of that, I'm safe. I can rest knowing that I am safe in God's arms. No wonder I'm glad. No wonder I'm full of joy. The creator of the universe is leading me and protecting me. And that is the key to leveraging the emotion of happiness into a state of perpetual joy, of being filled with joy. It's when we begin to understand that our happiness, it, it, can't, it can be found in nothing other than God. When, when things and, and people are the object of our affection and happiness, they will be here today and they will be gone tomorrow. They will not satisfy. But when our affection and our happiness are found in a God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever, a God that says he will never leave us or forsake us, a God that David describes that says he's right beside me, that's when happiness leads to a state of joy. Henry Nouwen, who was a a Dutch priest, he, he said this, joy is not the same as happiness. We can be unhappy about many things, but joy can still be there because it comes from the knowledge of God's love for us. Our whole life can be falling apart and everything making us unhappy, and yet we can still be filled with joy because as our life falls apart, we know that God doesn't. We know that he still loves us just the same. The more we, we recognize God's love for us, the more we are filled with joy. The, the more we live from a place of understanding that if there is one constant in our lives, it's knowing that we will always be loved by God and that he will always be right beside us. And this is when we start to change. When we start to really understand that, this is when we start to change. This is when we no longer look to find meaning or, or satisfaction in things that are temporary, it actually begins to, to bring transformation in our lives in the same way that it did for David, right? Knowing this, it brought transformation to David's life. In fact, he goes on in Psalm chapter 16 and verses 10 and 11. Listen to what he says. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. David, in these two verses, gives us two more keys to unlocking joy as a state of being. Not just a fleeting emotion, but but a state of being. He says, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Not only is David in this verse acknowledging that that placing our faith in God allows us to find new life, even after death. But he also is prophetically speaking about the coming of Jesus. He's teaching us that joy comes from an overflow of hope. Joy comes from an overflow of hope. David has an unending joy because of the hope that he has placed in God. And it reminds me of, of Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. And, and in Romans chapter 12, he said, Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Rejoice in our confident hope. And later in chapter 15, he says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, hope in people 
places or things will always end in heartbreak. Because people let us down, because things break, because places go away. They're not sustainable, but what David and Paul are, are, are trying to teach us and what, what they had found is when our hope is placed in something that is the same, yesterday, today, and forever, things change. There's a joy that comes with that. And Jesus said about himself that I, he's a solid foundation that no storm can ever move. That when we place our hope in him, we find that we can always be filled with joy, that he will remain with us through it all. But, but joy is a choice. And each day is a new opportunity to, to place our hope back in Jesus and be filled with the joy that comes from his comfort and his protection. And this is something that I have been learning very, um, I've been learning it the hard way over the past few months. You see, my wife, Allie, and I, we've entered this new season where we are preparing to, to move to plant a church in Portland, Maine. And I'm finding that each day I'm having to place my hope in God again. I'm having to remind myself that he is faithful and he has been faithful. It's through the hope that I have in him that I'm finding my life is is filled with joy, even in uncertainty, even as we still have not found a place to live, even as my my job situation is kind of up in the air right now, my life is filled with joy and an expectant heart that he is going to work in miraculous ways ways in the city of Portland and draw people to himself and that he will provide because he always has because he's he's always remained constant by my side but each day I'm finding that joy it just doesn't simply happen to us it's a choice and Henry now and again the Dutch priest he said joy does not simply happen to us We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. It is a choice based on the knowledge that we belong to God and have found in God our refuge and our safety and that nothing, nothing, not even death can take God away from us. And if maybe today you're struggling to believe in God, Maybe he seems too distant or too removed. I challenge you to look at the person of Jesus. Because Jesus came and lived on this earth as God in the flesh. He lived among us. He laughed. He cried. All so that we could see and experience who God is. And during his time with his followers, he gives them the key to experiencing joy in their lives. In John chapter 15, he says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. And when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Now listen to this next part. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Jesus tells those that follow him, if you remain in my love, if you place your hope in me, you will be filled with joy. So much joy that it will be overflowing. It's through our hope in Jesus and remaining in his love that we can experience a joy that lasts, not fleeting happiness. Now you can try other things. You can try sex and money and maybe even different spiritual experiences like crystals and psychics or even other religions. And I promise what you will find is that none of them will give you the joy that comes from knowing Jesus and placing your hope in him. Because not only does he fill you with a joy that lasts Our lifetime here on earth, joy is found when we die to ourselves and we come alive in Christ. That we experience joy that's that's everlasting in, in new life that he gives us. Now, while I have joy in my life right now from a relationship with Jesus, I also recognize that there is still a level of joy that I have not experienced yet. And I will not experience this side of heaven. When I 
chose to follow Jesus, the Bible says that I was given new life. A new life that that is sealed through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is now transforming me each day to look more like Jesus. But there is still another level of joy I have not experienced yet. So, so with that, let's go back to Psalm chapter 16 and what David says again. He says, For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life. Listen to this next part. Granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living you with you forever. Now, David is, again, he's prophetically talking about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He says, your holy one will not in, rot in the grave. Jesus rose three days after being buried and in doing so, he conquered death. Jesus even tells John, uh, the apostle John, this in Revelation chapter one, he says, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. No one else in history can claim that they have held or hold the keys of death and the grave. And in doing so, he promises everyone who puts their faith in him. Not only here is a new life that I'm going to give you here on earth, but I'm also going to give you the gift of living in the presence of God forever. And this is what David means in verse 11. He says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. However, sin or our disobedience to God and our selfish living, that sin does not want us to find our joy in God. Our sin wants us to try to find joy everywhere but our Creator. It keeps us separated from God, and this is why Jesus came. He lived, He died, He rose again to pay for all of the sins that you and I will ever commit or have ever committed and show us where we can find our true joy. That in, in Jesus, we can find hope, not only in this life, but hope for eternity. And then through that hope, we can find this joy that's everlasting. A joy that cannot be stolen from us in this life and an even greater joy that will be granted to those that, that spend eternity living in the presence of God. There was a, a Puritan a um, long time ago, his name's Thomas Watson, and he wrote this, after the fall, the affections were misplaced on wrong objects, right? Our affections were misplaced, sex, money, drugs, people, places, things. But then he goes on, he says, in sanctification or, or through choosing to follow Jesus and being made new, they are turned into a sweet order and harmony, a grief placed on sin, the love on God, and the joy on heaven. When we follow Jesus, he reorders our affection back to their original design. Now, everything that we just talked about, it hinges on one thing. This joy that we talked about as a state of being, this joy that comes from an, an overflow of hope, this joy that comes from finding uh, life in Jesus, to truly find lasting joy, it hinges on this one question. Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? Have you made the conscious decision to stop living for yourself, following your ambition, your desires, moving from one thing to the next, hoping that it makes you feel happy, hoping that it makes you feel fulfilled, meanwhile missing the, the fullness of joy that is offered to those who follow Jesus. There is not a more important question that I can ask during my final teaching as a pastor here at Grace Church, and that question is, have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? This is what we are all about as a church. This is why Sean and Billy started this 
church 18 years ago. This is why Allie and I moved back to New England from Texas five years ago to help plant a Grace Church in West Bridgewater. And this is why my wife and I are moving to Portland, Maine to start a church. We do these things in hope that people may have an opportunity to hear that Jesus loves them, that he paid for all of the sins that separated them from God. He paid for them on the cross and then he rose again after his death and offers us new life. And to also tell people that he will come again soon. Someday he's going to come back. Revelation chapter 22 verses 20 and 21 says, He who is the faithful witness to all of these things, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Jesus has promised that someday he will come back. And my prayer is that you are ready for that day. My prayer is that someday when he looks at you, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant, not depart from me and never knew you. A follower of Jesus has one job in this life, and that is to tell anyone and everyone who has ears to hear that they can find new life in Jesus, that they can experience the fullness of joy from an eternity spent with their creator in heaven. Please, 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 this is not something that is moderately important. In fact, one of my favorite quotes, I've said it before, I'll say it again, C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, but if it's true, of infinite importance, the only thing it can't be is moderately important. And so today, wherever you're watching from, whatever your background is, whatever struggles you're in right now, wherever you're searching for happiness, if today you're ready to start that relationship with Jesus, to, to make him the Lord of your life, I just want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Father, I'm sorry for all the times that I've disobeyed you. Please forgive me. I, I now see that I've been running from you, but I'm ready to stop running. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I choose to follow you for the rest of my days. Thank you for giving up your life so that I might find a new one. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer for the, the first time, the Bible says that you have just been given new life, a new life that is sealed with the promise and the gift of the Holy Spirit that your sins have been forgiven, the sins that you have committed and the sins that, sins that you will commit and that your relationship with the Father has now been restored and you will someday experience a fullness of joy like you could never imagine as you spend eternity with your Father in heaven. Now, maybe today you, you just need to get back on track. Like you've been following Jesus, but you've, you've gotten off track and you've been trying to find joy in things other than Jesus. And if that's you, today is your, your wake up call. Turn back to him. Come, come back to the person who offers you everything that you could ever need. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control and fullness of joy. Make it a priority again to, to read his word, to spend time in prayer talking with him, to be actively involved in the church, which is his body, to, to listen to the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. Just come back to him. It's been a, uh, it's been a privilege to serve at Grace Church in West Bridgewater and at Grace Church over the past five years. First as the kids and student director and then as the pastor of West Bridgewater. And I have seen what happens when Jesus takes over someone's life. 
I've seen marriages restored. I've seen kids baptize their parents and parents baptize their kids. I've seen addicts freed. I have seen mental health restored and prayers answered. And the Lord is not done yet. So do not shy away from the Holy Spirit's leading. Do not replace the person of Jesus in your life and continue to place your hope in a father that loves you no matter what. And in doing so, you will experience a joy that is unending. Let's pray. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Oh, thanks for being here and checking out this video. I really do wish that you found some clarity and hope as you navigate these really real emotions that God wired us to experience. Happiness is a really good thing, something that was part of God's plan for us to experience from the very beginning. But when it becomes an all-consuming obsession, when we can't stand to experience anything but happiness, we need to take a step back and evaluate deep down. As always, if there's anything that I can do to help you, just let me know. If you would like someone to pray with you or talk with you, please just reach out. Our church is here to help you learn more about God and help you take your next step in growing closer to Him. That's it for this week. We'll see you next time.